Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Tina. On our ninth Sunday after Pentecost, the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time, July 25th, 2021. Let us begin with our call to worship taken from Ephesians 3. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. May, May you, you have, have the, the power, power to know, know the love, the love of, of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now to the one who is able to accomplish far more than all we can ask or imagine. To, to God, God be, be the glory, glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. ever. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 281 and printed into your bulletin. Let us now continue with our prayer of confession in unison. Blessed Redeemer, have mercy upon us as we confess our sins. You endow us with goodness while we squander your blessings. We yearn for the possessions that our neighbors enjoy. Envy, greed, and selfishness consume us. Satisfaction eludes us as our cravings increase. Quiet our longing for material riches and help us trust in Jesus who provides for our needs, amen. And now may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. May you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. With that fullness will come the assurance that God forgives all our sins. And we say, praise God. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the 
Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Let us review the few announcements that we have in our bulletin. I will first start by saying those who are live streaming and at home at the uh, rear of the bulletin, you will see a variety of options that you can use to send in your tithings and contributions. If you have any questions about that, you can call the church office and they will provide all the answers that you need. If we look at the calendar of events, we'll see that on July 27th, Tuesday, at 6 p.m., there's photo club session number 10. This is the final session. On July 31st, at 10 a.m., there's a Zoom workshop in the parlor. Now, this is not for those who do not necessarily know how to Zoom. This is also for those who may want to know a few other functions and tweak their ability on this application. So all are invited. Um, if you have any questions for Saturday, July 31st at 10 a.m., you can reach out to Chininiwa Ogbenaya. Her email address is in the bulletin and her phone number is also in the directory. Again, we encourage everyone to join and have fun on this Zoom uh, session so that you can learn different applications in Zoom. Also, Shakespeare in the Park. You'll see a list of different dates um, if you're interested in, uh, in uh, joining um, our community with Shakespeare in the Park, Bergen County, this is in Overpeck Park. We will now turn to our scripture lessons taken from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 11, verses 14 and verses 26 through 27, and John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Let us begin with our scripture lessons for the today. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the, the Hittite. Then David sent messages to her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and the gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with, his, with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from the military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. We move on to John chapter six, verses one through 14. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. 
And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here was a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in, the, in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled, them, filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into this world. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
thou hast loved us, Lord, love us still. Despite our foolishness, despite the stuff that we do, Lord, keep on loving us because we need it. What's your favorite food? The food you could eat once a day for the rest of your life, if you had to. I think mine is coconut shrimp. White castles. White castles, okay. <laughs> okay. We all have a favorite food, but if you could eat it every day, if you, you know, could you eat it every day? At this time of the year, you can find food festivals all over the US that celebrate just about any kind of food you might enjoy. There's a garlic festival in Gilroy, California. Waikiki, uh, Waikiki, Hawaii hosts a spam festival every year. You'd expect that in Hawaii. If spam is really what you long for, you could find it there. Atlanta, Georgia holds a chump and stump festival every year that features a chili cook-off and bluegrass concert and dance. If you Google your favorite food, you can probably find a festival somewhere in the world that celebrates it. The town of Yamagata, Japan, holds a festival every year to celebrate a traditional soup called Imani. Thousands of people come from all over Japan, uh, at least they, in previous years they have, and even other parts of the world to eat Imani and have a good time. So the folks in Yamagata built a massive soup pot, which they fill with six tons of water, one and a half tons of beef, 3,500 onions, and lots of other ingredients. The soup cooks for hours, as you would imagine. Cooking that much soup would be a real challenge. But how do you serve it? Walmart, Walmart doesn't sell one ton soup ladles, do they? And if they did, how would you get it home? A few years ago, a team in Yamagata found a creative way to solve this problem. They bought two brand new earth diggers with specially made buckets. The buckets allowed them to dip out hundreds of servings of soup at once. In eight hours time, this team of cooks fed 12,695 bowls of Imani soup. They earned the title for most soup served in eight hours in the Guinness Book of World Records. Now they didn't include anything about sanitation in this whole thing about keeping this whole process sanitary that's you know that just kind of ran through my man, mind but anyway serving over 12,000 bowls of soup in eight hours when you think about how our bible passage today I want you to picture it through the eyes of Jesus disciples that's what as we said last week, they had traveled to a far shore of the Sea of Galilee, hoping to get a time away for some rest. But crowds of people, thousands of people, followed them to this remote area. They were hungering for a miracle or a message of hope. The tired disciples hoped Jesus would send them away. The situation of these tired disciples reminds me of a study that the US Army did a few years ago to determine the factors that contribute to the maximum level of output they could get out of their soldiers. How far could soldiers push themselves before their performance started to decrease? Well, they determined that after seven consecutive days of hard work without any rest, the soldier's performance level dropped. The interesting thing is soldiers weren't aware that their performance level had dropped. They thought they were doing fine. In their tired state, they believed that they were still operating at peak performance. 
That's how the mind plays tricks on you. Of course, if the army had just asked Jesus, they could have saved time and money on their study. You see, Jesus also would have told them that human beings should not work more than six days in a row. Then they should take a full day of rest afterwards. I believe he called it the Sabbath. Jesus' disciples needed some rest. You know the story. They wanted Jesus to send the crowd away, but instead Jesus asked Philip how they were going to feed this crowd of thousands of men, women, and children. For he knew that though we cannot live by bread alone, we cannot live without bread either. Philip was probably flabbergasted that Jesus even asked such a question about something that was so clearly impossible. Say what? Feed them? It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person just to get a bite. What are you talking about, Jesus? Fortunately, another disciple named Andrew came to the rescue, like our Andrew comes to the rescue sometimes. <laughs> All right, Andrew. There's a lad here, he said, who has five barley loaves and two fish. But they are, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. The feeding of the 5,000 is a marvelous story of God's provision for human, for human need. The focus is on bread, but the lesson is about all of life. Let's begin here. He told the people to sit down. We experience the blessings of God, first of all, when we take time to sit down. Does that sound too simple? Most of us say we're too busy to read the Bible or attend fellowship groups or of any kind. We pray in our cars as we rush to and from work or class or running our families around town. The idea that we should stop. Wait a minute. That's, what is that, Bruno Mars? <laughs> the idea that we should stop all of our activities and make time with Jesus a priority really annoys us. Why? Maybe it's because we've forgotten that the purpose of our life is to know and to glorify God. And we've forgotten that we have a God who is just waiting to provide for all our needs. Some of you will remember the old joke about a man who was waiting for a bus to Pasadena. In the bus station, he spotted a machine advertising your height, your weight, your fortune, only $1. Who is gonna pass up a deal like that, he thought. So he popped in a dollar and stepped on the scale. Out popped a card that said, you are five feet, 10 inches tall. You weigh 160 pounds. You are waiting for a bus to Pasadena. The man was amazed. How could a machine know that much about him? So he got the bright idea to fool the machine. He went to the men's restroom, changed his appearance. He turned his cap around backwards, put on some sunglasses, turned his shirt inside out, pulled a jacket out of his duffel bag. Finally, he stuffed his jacket with rolls of toilet tissue so he looked heavier. Then he went back stepped on the scale, put in a dollar, and another, and a card popped out. It read, you are five feet, 10 inches tall. You weigh 160 pounds. And while you were wasting time in the men's room, you missed your bus to Pasadena. <laughs> How many of us are so busy messing around with lesser priorities that we spend our whole life disconnected from God. Time with God is not a burden. 
It's what we are made for. We find our identity, our purpose, our strength, and our wisdom in spending time with God. A rector in the Episcopal Church said that each time a new vicar or pastor, as we would call it, was assigned to his area, he would sit down with that vicar or pastor and tell him to focus on his two most important duties. He wasn't talking about visiting the sick or serving in the community or preparing sermons. The two most important duties every vicar had were to nurture his relationship with Jesus and his relationship with his family. Ministry and life become empty and meaningless if we don't spend time with Jesus and with the people closest to us. Maybe the reason many of us live such barren lives is that we rarely set aside time to communicate with God. We are so busy doing this and that and that. We're so caught up in the rat race. We're so pressed for time that we have cut out that, that which gives us strength, that which gives us courage and the wisdom we need to strive successfully. So we need to stop for a moment and sit down in the presence of Jesus. Whether we call it prayer or meditation or reflection, whether we ask ourselves, what are my priorities or what is God calling me to be or what must I do to be in good relationship with life? It, what you do with that time or how you structure that time is up to you. But the important thing is that you stop for a moment and take some time on a regular basis. As the old song says, to have a little talk with Jesus. Take some time to stop and be in communication with our creator. Then we need to receive what Christ has to offer us, just as the crowd received the loaves and the fish. In other words, when we shut God out of our lives, we shut out the very one who can meet our deepest need. For you see, God's wish is to provide us with the good things of life. Do you understand how wonderful that is? God didn't have to create us. God didn't have to reveal himself in Jesus Christ, but that is God's character. God, God's nature is to give. God's nature is to love. In fact, love is giving. Indeed, God gives extravagantly. If we feel we are not receiving from God, the problem may be on our end, for you see ours is a giving God. I know I've told you the story before about the man who found himself trapped in his home by floodwaters. A neighbor came by in a canoe, said, get in, get, your, get, in, get you and your family in and I'll take you to dry land. He said, oh, no, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. God will provide. Well, the water rose. The man and his family fled from the first floor to the second floor. Somebody came by in a motorboat. Get in, get in. So the man let his family get in, but he stayed behind. He said, that's okay, you go on, take them, because I know God will provide. Well, the water kept coming. The flood came, kept rising. The water rose. The next thing you know, he had to go up to the roof. He looked up, there was a helicopter. They said, we're gonna drop down a lifeline, grab hold to the line, we'll pull you aboard. He waved them off, go on, go on. God will provide, he, sh he shouted up to them. Well, the waters kept rising. The house collapsed. The man fell in the water. He drowned, he died. He stood in front of the throne of God. He said, Lord, look at me. Why did you do this to me? I've been, prof I've been praising your name. I've been showing people I'm a person of faith. I kept telling them God will provide. And now look at me, I'm dead. People are gonna think about me as if I was wrong, as if I was a fool. Lord, why did you allow this to happen to me? And the Lord said to him, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. 
What else do you want? In the same way, God never stops thinking about us. As a loving creator, God awaits the opportunity to meet our needs. But so often we don't recognize that love in the various form in which it may come. We're looking for this when God has sent us that. We're looking for what we want when God has sent us what we need. We have not fixed our minds on receiving God's generosity. So it doesn't occur to us to live a thankful life. And I'm talking about an attitude of gratitude that goes beyond things turning out the way we want them. It doesn't occur to us to live a prayerful life. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about more than just that little prayer that we throw up when we are in trouble and when we don't know what to do. You know, that quick little prayer, Lord, help me. That's not a prayer for life. I'm talking about living in a state of prayer, living in a state of thanksgiving. And because we forget to do that, we are clueless. So often we wander blindly from problem to problem. I have a relative who every time you talk to her, got some problem, one major problem after another, but never looks at the stuff that goes on in between. What are you doing to contribute or to rely on God in between these things? Make the people sit down, Jesus commanded his disciples. Then he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed these loaves and these fish to all who were seated as much as they wanted. So also do we receive God's blessings when we sit down and wait, and when we receive what God offers us. Notice finally how John concludes his story. When they had all had enough to eat, he said. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. By the way, this is the only miracle that appears in all four gospels. The other three gospel writers stop right before this, but John includes in his version, a different piece, an additional piece. John says, they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. Why so much food left over? Did I say John, I meant Mark, Mark. This is the gospel we're reading from. Why was so much food left over? because that too is God's nature. Giving what is sufficient for today and providing for our tomorrows. When we receive what God has to offer us, we discover that God is a wondrous provider both for today and tomorrow. One of the lessons Christ tried to teach us was the extravagance of God that God provides in abundance. God sets before us a table in the midst of our enemies, fills our cup to overflowing. That same God, when wine is needed for the wedding feast, tells us to fill water pots and fill them to the brim. And when the prodigal returns, from, returns home, kills the fatted calf and throws a big party. You see, God is a wondrous provider, both for today and tomorrow. That's the message we get from this lesson. But you see, we have become so cynical and fearful. We don't really trust God's goodness. We don't trust that God knows our needs. And so we are stingy toward God, stingy toward others. We live with a constant sense of anxiety and weariness. Most of the worries that beset us would disappear in a moment if we could lean back and rest ourselves on the extravagance of God's provisions. A group of children was asked to describe what abundance means. Allison, age seven said, abundance 
is an extra bowl of ice cream and getting to stay up late and laughing a lot. Emily, age nine, said abundance means I have as many books as I want to read and lots of warm clothes for the winter. And it means there's always lots of love. Brian, age 10, said abundance means we have everything we need even though we don't have everything we want yet. It makes me feel safe. Think about what Brian answered for a second. Abundance means we have everything we need even though we don't have everything we want yet. It makes me feel safe. Every miracle Jesus ever performed, including this one, was meant to show us the, prop, the priorities and the nature of God. The healings, turning water into wine, feeding the multitudes, calming the storms, all of the miracles in the New Testament emphasize the priorities and nature of God. So what is the reason for God's extravagance? Perhaps God wants to prepare us for the greater extravagance of heaven. God has so many blessings to pour out on all of us. He asks us to sit down and receive what he has to give. What he has to give, he gives with extravagance. As Paul once wrote, I have not seen nor ear heard nor the heart conceived what has been prepared for those who love God. In Rome, right next to the Vatican is a beautiful 19th century palace the Palazzo Migli Migliori, I believe that's how it's pronounced. This palace was recently available for sale. Its size and beauty and location are right off of St. Peter's Square. And because of that location, it made it worth a small fortune. And someone could have made a lot of money turning it into an exclusive hotel. Instead, the family who owned it chose to donate this gorgeous palace to the Roman Catholic Church. And Pope Francis made a decision that must have made God smile. He turned it into a homeless shelter. It's called the Palace of the Poor. You see, the original name Migliori meant the best. So instead of palace of the best, it's now palace of the poor. The palace, which has 16 bedrooms, now houses 50 homeless men and women. Volunteers provide them with hot meals. Residents report that the palace feels more homelike than the crowded shelters that are usually open to them. Sharon Kristen a researcher working on a project involving homelessness comment, uh, com commented rather. What is special about this palace is that it's not about maximizing dollar signs, but giving people a really beautiful place to be with the idea that beauty heals. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe the Palazzo Migliori is a vision of the abundant blessings prepared for those who love God. Homeless people in need of food and shelter are welcomed into a luxurious mansion and fed hot meals. Curious crowds of people following Jesus are invited to sit for a surprise meal and they all eat their fill. And there's still plenty of leftovers. The message from the Gospel of John this morning is that Jesus is the bread of life. The word become flesh, the good shepherd, the light of the world. He dealt with not just the disciples that were there, but with all the hungry people. He invited them all, whether bourgeois or working class, whether Gentile or Jew, to sit on the green grass to be served with him as a host. The loaves Jesus breaks is the food available. Barley bread eaten by the poor. 
But you see, the miracle is not just that all are fed from the scant resources. The miracle is also that all are satisfied. That's a vision of the priorities and nature of a loving, generous God who likewise makes provisions for our needs. We're not talking about the wants. That's a whole nother subject. But provision for our needs, both today and tomorrow. So I invite you to sit down. Have a purpose in sitting down. Don't just sit there and <laughs> <laughs> sit down. Take a little time. Think about that generosity. Receive the blessings God has stored up for you and recognize that because of a thing called grace, God does indeed look beyond our faults and not only sees our needs, but provides for our needs today and in the days to come. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that brought my liberty. I do not know just why Christ came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous! How marvelous that grace had part my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw. Keep that thought in mind as you sit down, as you allow God to speak to you, as you reflect on the blessings that are poured out upon you. He looks beyond all of our faults and sees our need today and tomorrow. As we think about those who are listed on our prayer list. We offer prayer knowing that God will meet all of the needs that are expressed within our family of faith. Now, we start our time of sharing and joys and concerns with our thanks, a prayer of thanksgiving. Jonathan Elvis Opoku is now six months old, mm -hmm. the son of Elvis and Priscilla. He was just, you know, he was preemie. He was in the hospital for a while and he's thriving now. And so we give thanks. He turned um, six months old at the beginning of the month. Elder Men and Fredericks, we offer a prayer of concern as well as Thanksgiving. Her brother Mark was in the hospital in Pennsylvania, uh, but he's now been diagnosed and it's, it's treatable. And so we lift him up in prayer this morning. We lift up the uh, family of Reverend Milton Nunez Coba and his wife. 
Reverend Nunez is a Presbyterian pastor in our region. He pastors a church in Jersey City, but he lived in Inglewood. And uh, his house was hit by lightning on the 8th of July, house burned down. And so Reverend Nunez is you know, homeless. He and his wife are homeless now. Hopefully the house will be rebuilt in six months, but we lift them up in prayer as they go through this traumatic uh, experience uh, to have a house burned down and everything in it and still try to continue to pastor. Uh, to be on the road, so we lift him up in prayer. Also, we would lift up in prayer the family of Reverend Carlos Reyes. Reverend Reyes, we met about uh, eight years ago. He was the pastor of Inglesia Pentecostal that um, meets here on in uh, during the weekend on Saturday. Reverend Reyes, uh, served for 65 years as the pastor of that church. He then became the administrator of the Washington Heights Pentecostal movement under, you know, where the uh, church is listed under uh, in New York. And Reverend Reyes lives in Teaneck. He died uh, this week. And so we lift up that family in prayer. But 65 years in ministry. We also would remember those who are on our continuing prayer list, Arya Cho, Mary Coleman, Mr. Henry Robinson, Carmen Henry, Mr. Blaine Shaw, who will be preparing for <coughs> surgery in September, Mary Greg Whitey, Whited, who will be preparing for her next medical procedure, my sister Jolene Tate, who is uh, receiving medical treatments, some experimental, and we lift up prayer of concern for the growing number of unvaccinated persons who are falling victim to the Delta strand of COVID-19. Uh, you know, we hope that you know, they find the information that they need to, to make the decision that needs to be made to do what needs to be done in order that they remain safe yes. and alive. Uh, in our bulletin information, we, for those that uh, received the e-blast, there's a, a uh, uh, blurb there that tells you about a video done by Suzette Turner's cousin, I believe it is, yes. uh, on the COVID-19 uh, vac uh, vaccination. COVID-19 vaccination and the Delta strand. So we, uh, it's on YouTube. And so we invite you to look at that. Uh, Dr. Tamara, Dr. Tamara, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. As we lift up all of these who have been named, those who have not been named. As we lift up each family represented here, Oh God of tenderness, you cradle creation in your bosom. We give you thanks for how you care for its needs. We, you refresh it with the same waters that are poured on us at baptism, a reminder of your covenant, which brings new life. You cleanse creation through the purging presence of your Holy Spirit as the fresh breezes replace stale air. Not a day goes by without countless reminders of how you care for us. Those, how you care for creation that you gave birth to. We give thanks for your care which surrounds us. We pray for the young who begin a new life in utter dependence. We pray for the unborn and the newborn who drew their first nourishment from another body. We, have remind, we are reminded of how needful we are, Lord. So we pray that you would give us hearts that reach out to children. Give us wisdom to share with them. 
We pray not only for the children that we see, but the children of creation, the children of humanity from whom we are alienated. If it's because of hostility or anger, Lord, give us a spirit of reconciliation sufficient to approach them and seek forgiveness. If we are alienated because of skin color or different races, Lord, give us a sense of the length of Christ's table around which all will dine and rejoice. If, it's, if we're alienated because they taunt us or otherwise cause us discomfort, Lord, give us grace enough to show tenderness and to reflect the tenderness that you give to us. So Lord, we come this morning praying that you would make us agents of compassion, agents of understanding, agents of reconciliation. Here are individual prayers, oh Lord. Our prayers for comfort, our prayers for healing, our prayers for reconciliation. Here are collective prayers, our, our prayers for justice, our prayers for compassion, our prayers for peace. And in Christ's name, O oh Lord, grant us your will, even as we pray in the manner in which we are taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, Jesus, thy boundless love to me. No thought can reach, no tongue declare, O oh, knit my thankful heart to thee and reign without a rival there. All who are able can stand. Jesus, Jesus thy boundless love to me. No thought can reach, no tongue own is my thankful heart to thee and reign and reign without a rival there thine holy thine alone I give myself to thee entirely give oh grant that
Please be seated for our folks. those who are online to unmute themselves and to 